start off, um, I want to introduce all three speakers um, at the beginning, and then we will um, uh, then we we will commence. So first of all, Diego Olivia will be um, presenting the first paper. Um, Diego is a postgraduate researcher at the Centre for Social Investigation and a research fellow at Nuffield College, University of Oxford, where he works with Dave Kirk on a project focused on some long-term consequences of the exposure of, uh, to police brutality and gun violence in the US. He's previously received his PhD from the London School of Economics and Political Science in 2021 this year, where he worked with John Jackson. Diogo is a quantitative criminologist and his research interests include the consequences of police uh, misconduct, um, uh, uh, um, aggressive policing tactics, and particularly in terms of people's relationship to authority. Topics in which he's particularly interested include legitimacy of the law, uh, the legal institutions, over-policing and under-policing, procedural justice theory, legal cynicism and uh, legal socialisation. In some previous ongoing studies, he's used longitudinal survey data to investigate the extent to which the police misconduct shaped public attitudes towards legal authority, uh, with particular focus on high, high crime contexts, such as the city of Sao Paulo in, in Brazil. Um, we also have Ben Bradford, uh, those of you who are regulars on this particular series will know Ben Bradford, but for those of you who don't, uh, Ben Bradford is a Professor of uh, Global City Policing at the Department of Security and Crime Science. He's Director of the Giordano Institute, Institute, uh, Institute for Global City Policing, um, a joint initiative funding by UCL and the Metropolitan Police and the uh, uh, Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime in London uh, to promote policing research in London. Ben's research interests include public trust, police legitimacy, cooperation and compliance in justice settings, social identity as a factor in all these processes. He also published on organisational justice uh, with police agencies, uh, ethnic and uh, other dis uh, disparities in policing and elements of public facing police work such as uh, neighbourhood patrol, community engagement and stop and search. In addition to his work with the MPS and MOPAC, Ben has also collaborated with organisations including the College of Policing, Police Scotland, West Midlands Police, and on a variety of other projects. Um, his book, Stop and Search in Police Legitimacy, was published by Routledge in 2017, and he is uh, the editor, um, along with uh, Patrice uh, Jurigi, Ian Loder, and uh, 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 Steinberg of the Sage Handbook of Global Policing, and co-author with Kevin Morrell of Policing and Public Management, uh, Routledge in 2018. Justice Tankerby is an Associate Professor of Criminology at the University of Cambridge. He received his PhD in Criminology uh, from the University of Cambridge prior uh, uh, to, uh, to coming to uh, Cambridge. He uh, studied for a BA Honours in uh, Sociology at the University of Ghana in Ligon. He was awarded a postdoctoral research fellowship by the Economic Social Research Council, the British Academy and Fitzwilliam College. Uh, Justice's research interests are in police and state legitimacy, corruption, police violence and vigilantism. He, curr uh, he currently research projects including legitimacy, legitimacy and counter-terrorism policing in the UK, uh, police violence in Ghana and corruption among prospective elites in Ghana. So we have a fantastic panel there and uh, no doubt some really interesting papers to be delivered. Um, so I'd now like to pass on to Diago. Um, so if you could just load your slides up. There you go. Is it on again? Yep, we can all see that. So that's great. So I'll, I'll pass Brilliant. on to you now, Diago. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tiago. Uh, I'll be presenting uh, a paper called Violence and Coercive Policing, Dynamics and Consequences of the Over-Policing and Under-Policing Paradox in Brazil's largest city. Uh, this is one of the papers of my PhD thesis that I recently concluded at the LSE, supervised by John Jackson. Um, so today, uh, uh, for this presentation, this is a very brief presentation. I'm not going to talk uh, uh, about the whole paper, just a few things that are more interesting in it. And basically I have four parts of that presentation. First of all, I'll, I'll discuss the initial motivation that I had for it. So. Uh, where basically I'm coming from and, and uh, uh, where I'm coming from, where, why this, this research questions make sense for me as a researcher. Then I'll briefly introduce this study, uh, the type of data that I'll be analyzing uh, uh, and the research questions that I'm willing to answer. I'll very, very quickly go through some of the results 
uh, and conclude with some some uh, discussions on the substantive implications of of that. Uh, so basically, I start as as well. I'm a quantitative criminologist. Uh, and I'm coming from a procedural justice um, background. So I'm very interested in procedural justice theory. Uh, I'm guessing that plenty of you will be very familiar with procedural justice theory, but very, very briefly, uh, what do I mean by that? What, why am I interested in procedural justice theory? What do I understand by that? So basically I'm, I'm very interested in studying police legitimacy. I want to understand uh, the ex why in the extent to which people recognize legal authority, legal institutions and the police in particular, as the rightful authority, when people recognize that uh, legal institutions are morally appropriate and they have authority to govern um, and so on. But how, how do the police gain legitimacy? How do people recognize uh, uh, legal authority, legal institutions as the rightful authority? Uh, one way to enhance that um, is the we can frame that under, within the, under the umbrella of police trustworthiness. So when people, uh, believe that the police are trustworthy to behave in ways, they're trustworthy to exercise that their power in ways uh, that are in accordance with their normative expectations, uh, their beliefs about the legitimacy of the police will, uh, will enhance. Uh, but of course, this idea of police trustworthiness is task, spe is task specific. So uh, people will judge uh, whether police officers are trustworthy to uh, effectively fight crime and ensure public safety and behave with procedural fairness and so on. And which specific criteria people will uh, use to judge the normative appropriateness of the exercise of power um, is an empirical question. And, and an empirical question that I'm overall very interested in. Um, and of course, one way to, that the police can conduct themselves uh, in order to enhance police trustworthiness and, and therefore enhance judgments uh, of legitimacy is through contact, is through interactions. So uh, the idea here is that police sits in interactions and the, and the cumulative effect of those interactions throughout the life course, uh, these are moments when people will, event, will uh, basically judge how the exercise of power, uh, uh, how, how the police are exercising their power. And to the extent that the exercise of power corresponds to their normative expectations, uh, that can uh, that can lead them to believe that the police uh, that police officers usually behave like that, and that will eventually enhance their judgments about the legitimacy of the police. Uh, of course, procedural justice theory is very big, well, on procedural justice. Uh, so one of the key hypotheses here is that when people experience, when people perceive police officers communicating procedural justice, uh, this will enhance their judgments about the legitimacy of the police. But why? Why is procedural justice uh, important? Why does it make sense that when people experience procedural justice, uh, their, uh, uh, their beliefs of the legitimacy of the police will enhance? This is one of the questions that I'm overall very interested in. And, and basically one of the key things here is the type of messages that police conduct sends. When, uh, uh, when people perceive police conduct to be sending positive messages of inclusion, for instance, the idea that police are communicating that people, that individuals are valued members of society, uh, then people will feel like they are part of that society that uh, the police and the authority represent, and, and then they will uh, uh, increase their uh, sentiments of legitimacy. On the other hand, when people perceive police conduct to be sending negative max messages uh, of exclusion, for instance, they will uh, believe that they are not valued members of society. They, they are not included in the group uh, that the police and the authority represent. Uh, so that's the, that's the one general framework that I'm coming from. Uh, uh, and overall, that's, that, that's, that's one of my first initial motivations. The second motivation is how to study all that, how to study police citizen relations, uh, um, public authority relations in, uh, and more generally in the context of the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. The city of Sao Paulo in Brazil uh, uh, is a massively large city. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the, the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo has a population of 20 million people, uh, which is absolutely massive. And it's, ex it's an extremely heterogeneous city. Um, we have, of course, high levels of poverty. But not only that, we have extremely high levels of inequality. Uh, and 
to, to what concerns us most here for this presentation. It's a city with very high crime rates, uh, taking the homicide rate, uh, for instance, it's not one of the most violent cities in Brazil. It's actually one of the least violent cities in Brazil, but we still have a homicide rate of uh, approximately 10 for uh, 100,000 habitants, which on itself, it, it's very high for European standards. It's comparable to, to a few American cities, but the striking detail of that is, is, is that it's a very heterogeneous situation. So depending on the neighborhood that you're analyzing, depending on the neighbor, on the district that you're analyzing within Sao Paulo, that homicide rate can go from less than one homicide for 100K people to approximately 20 for 100K. Um, and that heterogeneity is one of the things that I'm very interested in analyzing. And of course we have police uh, uh, police violence, we have aggressive policing. Uh, the, the, the general tactics used by, by, by the main police force in the city of Sao Paulo is extremely aggressive. We have a militarized police force. Uh, all police officers carry guns all the time. Uh, they threat uh, to use their guns constantly. Um, not only aggressive policing tactics are uh, ex very common or the, 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 the elected tactic for policing uh, in the city, but we also have lots of cases of police violence. So uh, the estimation is that around 10% of all violent deaths uh, in the city are police killings. So how can we study uh, uh, police legitimacy and public authority relationships in this context? So coming from a procedural justice theory perspective, trying to understand uh, what aspect of police conduct communicate inclusion and exclusion in the context of the city of Sao Paulo, I was trying to, 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 to come up with uh, in interesting research questions. But there is a third uh, aspect um, that motivated me for this specific study. And well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a quantitative researcher. I, uh, I work with quantitative methods, but I'm actually a frustrated qualitative researcher because I think qualitative research is extremely interesting, is in a way much, uh, uh, it, it's such more, much more interesting than quant research actually. And the only reason why I don't do uh, qualitative research is simply uh, I don't have the skills. I think it's much more complicated than quant research. But one of the things that I like to do very often is read qualitative research, read ethnographies. And I like to read ethnographies also to understand what's going on on, on, on neighborhoods and maybe try to come up with a few hypotheses being, being described in, in, in qualitative studies so that I can then test those hypotheses using quantitative methods. Uh, and so I decided to dive in into some ethnographies of over-policed neighborhoods. And when you, when you start reading that literature, uh, this is a very common literature in, 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 in some global South context and also in, in some uh, large cities in the US. So all the quotes that I'm displaying here are, are all from the US, from cities like Philadelphia, Chicago, Oakland. Um, and we're talking about neighborhoods that are very over-policed, that the police presence is felt uh, uh, constantly. So people feel constant police presence. People in those neighborhoods feel uh, that police officers treat them with suspicion all the time. They feel like police officers are treating them as potential criminals. They are suspected of something the whole time. And generally this, there's this idea that there's this expectation that police officers will repeatedly intrude upon their lives. Well, none of that is new. Uh, uh, there are some neighborhoods where uh, uh, residents simply feel uh, very over-policed and in most of the cases, because they are indeed over-policed. But something that was interesting when I started reading those, those ethnographies is that it, a very common report from, from those neighborhood residents is the idea that they actually also feel under-policed at the same time. Uh, they feel that despite the huge, the massive police presence almost constantly, uh, there's actually police absence when they're in need of police protection. And therefore they develop this idea, uh, they develop a, a sense of skepticism about police protections. It's as if they are seeing police officers all the time, but they are seeing police officers acting against them, not in order to protect them. Uh, and then they develop these expectations that police officers will simply fail to ensure public safety. So at the same time that they feel over police, they feel that they see police officers uh, constantly on the streets. They feel like those police officers on the street are not there to protect them. Uh, uh, they are there against them, not in order to protect them. Uh, 
And this, of course, uh, is very close to the messages of inclusion and exclusion and being a valued member of society that I was talking earlier. But I'll get back. Uh, I'll get back to this point. This idea of neighborhoods being uh, uh, facing over policing and under policing at the same time uh, was labeled by the literature as the over policing under policing paradox. The idea that policing is a constant part of the lives of, of many neighborhood residents, and at the same time, police are not there to protect them. Okay, so taking those three. Uh, initial motivation. So coming from a procedural justice perspective, interested in studying aspects of police conduct that communicate inclusion and exclusion. In the context of Sao Paulo, where people are very fearful of crime generally, but they're also very fearful of the police in particular. And taking that, uh, uh, this idea of the over-policing, under-policing paradox uh, that is very common uh, in, in ethnographic reports, I decided to come up with this specific study. So what are the goals uh, of my study here? What are my research questions? What am I, am I investigating here? All right, so in the context of uh, uh, policing in Sao Paulo neighborhoods, I was interested in, in three questions. First of all, based on, the, on those ethnographic reports that over-policing and under-policing walk side by side, people feel over-policed and under-policed at the same time. They see a lot of police presence, but they don't feel like police officers are there to protect them. I decided to ask, to investigate, do perceptions of over-policing and under-policing actually reproduce each other over time, creating a type of vicious circle where the more over-policed one feels, the more under-policed they feel and vice versa. Uh, and on the, same, uh, um, on the same vein, thinking of the dynamics of over-policing and under-policing, I asked, are perceptions of over-policing and under-policing produced by similar social forces. So do they share correlates? Are they produced by similar social factors? So these are my first two research questions. But of course, I'm coming from a, a procedural justice perspective. And what I'm actually interested in here is in asking, do perceptions of over-policing and under-policing undermine police legitimacy? Could this be one aspect of police conduct uh, that actually sends negative messages uh, of exclusion um, and, and make pe people feel like they're not valid members of society. And therefore that might actually undermine judgments of uh, the legitimacy of the police. So these are the three big questions uh, that I wanted to answer. There are a few more questions that I, uh, that I uh, investigate on the paper, but I'm focusing for this presentation on those three. How did I do that? What type of data did I analyze? So I'm relying on survey data and specifically rely on longitudinal survey data from the city of Sao Paulo. So we uh, uh, we came up with a survey that was representative of residents of eight selected areas, eight selected neighborhoods in the, neighborhoods in the city of Sao Paulo. I can uh, uh, expand more on what those eight neighborhoods specifically mean uh, later on, if anyone is curious. Uh, we had 1,200 respondents across three waves. Uh, the three waves were collected in 2015, 17, and 18, with approximately uh, eight months between waves. And in that survey, basically, uh, we had a bunch of measures, of course. There was a very uh, uh, a very large project, generally. Uh, but we had specific measures of over-policing, for instance. And what do I mean by perceived under-policing? Well, to measure perceived over-policing, sorry, to measure perceived over-policing, uh, I used survey items tapping into this idea of perceptions of police intrusion. So the expectations that police officers will repeatedly intrude upon the lives of neighborhood residents. I also had measures, uh, I also had survey items to measure what I'm calling perceived under policing. So I had survey items tapping into the idea of skepticism about police protection, the expectation that officers will fail to ensure public safety. Um, finally, I also had measures of police legitimacy, of course, uh, I had survey items uh, tapping into duty to obey the police, normative alignment, fear of the police. I could actually uh, give a whole separate talk just to, to, to discuss how we actually measured uh, police legitimacy for this for this paper. Um, I won't go into, de into the details right now, but essentially what we have is we had a, a continuum, a continuum ranging from coercive uh, reasons to obey the police to normative uh, reasons to obey the police. Um, we also had a few more measures, but those three were the central ones to, to, to answer the three research questions that I displayed um, uh, a few minutes ago. All right, so I'll show you some results as well, as this is, of course, a, a, a quantitative research. 
but I won't go into the technical details, of course, because most people uh, uh, do not rightfully do not care about that. But if anyone is uh, curious or more interested in knowing the details uh, and the, of the analytic strategies that I uh, uh, developed for this study, I'm more than happy to answer them later on. But focusing on the substance, I started with the first two questions that I had focused on the dynamics of the over-policing and under-policing paradox. My first question, of course, was uh, uh, about the reciprocal relationship between over-policing and under-policing. The idea that uh, over-policing and under-policing reproduce each other over time. So I estimated a cross-lagged uh, panel model. It doesn't really matter what that is, but very quickly, what I had here, I have measures of over-policing and measures of under-policing at each of the three time points. So over-policing and under-policing at time point one, time point two, and time point three. And I'm basically uh, assessing those relationships over time. So uh, for instance, the changes in over-policing uh, uh, from time point one to time point two, to what extent can that be attributed to uh, perceptions of under-policing at time point one? And simultaneously, exactly at the same time, what about the, 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 the other relationship? What about predicting under-policing uh, using measures of over-policing? So basically what I'm asking here is, the more over-policed one feels, does that lead to them feeling more under-policed in a future time point? And simultaneously, the more under-policed one feels, does that lead them to feel more over-policed in a future time point? Um, that's what this model is doing. Um, of course, I also had some covariates. So for instance, I was also, uh, uh, because my second question was about whether or not they, they share similar social forces. So uh, I asked respondents whether they had recently been stopped by the police, specifically whether they had been recently stopped by the police at gunpoint, which is a, a surprisingly high proportion, uh, a, a very large proportion. I can talk about that later on. Uh, but each time point, I also ask, uh, I'm also testing the association of police stops at gunpoint with over policing and under policing and a bunch of demographic variables. But let's see a few results here. My first question, my first research question Do perceptions of over policing and under policing reproduce each other over time? The answer is yes, according to my data, yes. So, uh, again, if, if you're not, don't worry about the table. Uh, uh, what matters here is, um, um, the table is basically showing uh, the, 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 the crossed relationship here, the, the under-policing at time point one to over-policing in time point two, and over-policing in time point one to under-policing in time point two, and so on, and also from time point two to time point three. But what matters here is, yes, the more under police, so the more skeptic about police protection one is at a previous time point, the more over police they will feel in, a, in the next time point. And likewise, the more over policed one feels at a previous time point, the more under police they will feel at the next um, time point. So the idea that this is a reciprocal relationship, the idea that perceptions of over policing and under policing are reproducing each other over time, uh, creating a type of vicious circles. My second question, are perceptions of over policing and under policing um, produced by similar social forces? Yes, um, I know this is more of a messy table here, but on what matters? Being stopped by the police at gunpoint is associated with increases in perceptions of over-policing and under-policing at each time point. We also have some very interesting demographic differences here. So for instance, uh, white people, which are slightly more than half of the Sao Paulo population are less over-policed than non-white people women are uh, less, they feel less protected than men and so on. I can, I can discuss those results uh, if people are more interested uh, as well uh, later on. And finally, my third question, what about the consequences of the over-policing and under-policing paradox? Specifically, do perceptions of over-policing and under-policing undermine police legitimacy? The answer again is yes. Uh, on, again, not caring too much about the table, but what we can see here is even controlling for perceptions of procedural fairness and perceptions of police effectiveness, which are known predictors of police legitimacy in this context, we can see that the more, uh, that the more people feel like police officers are repeatedly intruding upon the lives of neighborhood residents, uh, the, more, the less legitimacy uh, uh, that they, they, they have. And the same goes for 
uh, perce uh, perceptions of under policing. The more skeptic people are of police protection, um, the, the, the larger the damages on their judgments about the legitimacy of the police. So what do we conclude from that? And this is my final, my time is up. I have one minute left and this is my final slide. What's, what are some implications of, of, of this study here? So substantive implications that basically thinking of procedural just theory, uh, what I'm showing here is that first of all, uh, uh, based on the ethnographic evidence uh, uh, that I used to come up with a hypothesis, that makes a lot of sense. Indeed, it looks like perceptions of over-policing and under-policing are indeed mutually reproducing each other. They are creating a type of vicious cycle. Uh, uh, so basically one is associated with each other over time. Uh, but more interestingly for, for procedural justice theory, uh, it seems like people indeed have safety related normative expectations about police work. What does that mean? Well, people want to be safe uh, and people want to, and people expect police officers to ensure their safety, to provide protection and they will judge police conduct accordingly. This is different from uh, 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 police effectiveness. I can talk more about the distinction between uh, uh, over policing, under policing, and police effectiveness. But the idea here is that people have those normative expectations. They will they will judge police conduct accordingly. Um, and why and, and and why does over policing and under policing contribute to damages in police legitimacy? Well, that goes back to that those messages of inclusion and exclusion that I was talking before. Procedural justice um, sends very clearly positive messages of inclusion. Uh, and under-policing and over-policing send very clearly negative messages of suspicion, intrusion, and lack of protection that make people feel like they are not valued members of society. And basically, to my final words here, what I'm concluding here, uh, this is just suggestive, of course, but it's the idea that more aggressive and intrusive uh, police presence does not necessarily translate into perceptions of public safety, uh, and that zero tolerance, coercive policing strategies uh, that actually do not ensure public safety, that fail to provide protection to people, uh, that actually could undermine people's recognition of legal institutions, of legal authority as the rightful authority. That's what I had to, to talk about today. Thank you very much. Um, that's it. Hey, thank you, Tiago. That's a really interesting presentation there, um, particularly about you know the uh, policing in, in in Brazil and some of the challenges uh, around over policing and under policing. So thank you, thank you for that. And those of you who'd like to ask uh, Tiago some questions at the end, please please put them in the the chat box, and we'll we'll put put them to him at the end. Uh, can I now um, uh, bring in uh, Ben Bradford, who will be delivering our second presentation, uh, which is on policing compliance. Is procedural justice relevant to highly marginalised people living on the streets of London? So, Ben, I'll pass over to you. Ben, you're still muted. That's a great start, isn't it? Um, I was just saying to, <laughs> to the ether um, that um, those of you who registered for this seminar originally would have seen that Layla Skins was booked to appear. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it. And then we uh, tried to pencil in my colleague, uh, Arabella Kiprinides, and she couldn't make it. So I'm the third choice keeper here. And, and what I'm going to do is, is going to present the paper that, that Arabella would have, uh, would have presented. It's all gone horribly wrong here. What's going on with my screen? Hmm. It's amateur hour. There's something going wrong with my external screen. I'll just bring myself back and try that again. Hang on one second. Um, so yeah, we talk about the paper that, that Steve introduced uh, while I'm messing around with this, um, which is looking at um, compliance, um, procedural justice theory and compliance uh, among um, a highly marginalized um, population in London, which is people living on the streets. And if I can work out how to get this slides back up, I can start talking. Uh, Steve, can you see that normally or does it look horrible? Um, I can't see anything at the moment. Um, no, we haven't got anything up at the moment. Before there's, it, there's a bit a bit fuzzy. A bit fuzzy. Mm, dear. Let me just try and uh, I think I might. Ah, is that better? I can't see anything at the moment. 
Can't see anything at all. No. Let me just try one more time. Right, draw comments yourselves. I'm going to sort this out. Um, well, that looks horrible. What's happened here? Um, can you see that? Uh, I think it's coming. Yes, but it looks a bit horrible. Yeah. <laughs> Do you need time to sort it out? Is that better? Okay. Oh, that's better. I was going to oh, offer right. to, to. There you go. There you go. Better. Phew. Right. Right. There. Okay. So as I was saying before, I rudely interrupted myself. Um, what we're interested in this paper is, is the kind of classic um, question underlying much uh, pseudo justice theory research, um, which is what police can do to motivate compliance with the law. Um, and in, in this body of research, um, we regularly um, compare and contrast two fundamental approaches, I guess you could characterize them as, uh, characterize them as a deterrence-based approach, which is looking at the extent to which police can, can demonstrate effectiveness um, in, in fighting crime, if you like to want to put it that way, and generating a deterrent effect and the extent to which that deterrent effect has an effect on people's offending behaviour or their compliance behaviour, two sides of the same coin, obviously. Um, and in this literature, we regularly contrast that deterrence based approach to policing to a procedural justice based approach to policing, which would suggest, um, or at least the claim is that the best way the police have for motivating compliance with the law is behaving with procedural justice, generating legitimacy and those things together um, enhance or motivate compliance. And it's a key claim of the procedural justice model theory, um, at least, um, that that procedural justice legitimacy pathway it is both ethically more desirable and then a long term more effective than a deterrence based approach that relies on demonstrating effectiveness and, and in a sense purchasing uh, and compliance on, on a day to day basis. We're really interested in, in testing that that basic contrast within a, within a population of extremely marginalised um, people living on the streets of London, um, whom, as we'll see, see shortly, um, ha have really, really high levels of offending. Um, I think it's fairly clear why deterrence um, should promote compliance or should um, be linked to people's offending behaviour, um, at least from a theoretical perspective, so rational choice, lots of other theoretical perspectives suggest that if you make behaviour more subjectively risky and or more subjectively costly, people are less likely to engage in it. The link between procedural justice, legitimacy and compliance um, is, is a bit more complicated. Um, so I'll just spend a, a couple of minutes thinking about that. So procedural justice theory is really based on the idea that, that, that legitimacy motivates compliance. And there's two basic pathways or two basic mechanisms through which legitimacy might, procedural justice and legitimacy might affect compliance. First is because legitimacy, when you, when you grant legitimacy to a legal institution such as a police, um, the claim is that you begin to internalize the values that that, that, author, that authority, that institution is meant to embody, the law, the values of the law, the principles of the law, the moral, the moral force of the law. So granting legitimacy to the police means internalization of the value that it's appropriate to do the right thing, to obey the law, to follow the dictates of, of this, of this um, properly constituted institution, this legitimate institution. Um, the second mechanism for which procedural justice legitimacy is, is thought to in influence compliance uh, references more clearly the kind of social psychological roots of procedural justice theory. Um, and, and the argument here is something along the lines that procedural justice promotes identification with the authority and with the group that authority represents, so with the police and with the group the police represents, which we can pass as the state, the nation, community, those kinds of groups. And when you feel included, when you feel valued within that group in the way that Tiago has just been talking about, you're motivated for, for a number of reasons, not least self-presentation, um, to, to, to follow the rules of that group. And of course, when you talk about the police and the groups, the police represent the rules of the, the group, are, are the law. So you're, you're because you feel included in the group, um, you, you're motivated to comply with the rules, the laws um, that govern the behavior people's behavior within that particular context. Of course, the key claim underlying all of this really um, is that procedural justice is relational. So for example, um, we talk about procedural justice strengthening the bonds between an individual and an institution. It makes people feel socially closer in a number of interesting and quite uh, mutually constitutive and quite complicated ways. It makes people feel closer to the institution that they experience procedural justice from, in this case, the police. But what if those social bonds, what if the question of social bonds um, are irrelevant? 
um, or what if they're ruptured by context? And this is really what motivated us to look at people living in a, in a socially extreme situation, in other words, people living um, in the street, on the streets. Um, so we wanted to know what motivated compliance uh, among this marginalized group. Um, and as I've already suggested, really, um, one of the reasons for doing so is, is testing the social justice theory within a highly, highly marginalized social group where we might expect some of some group dynamic aspects of social justice theory to kind of attenuate perhaps would be a better way of putting it. Um, we're also interested in this for a kind of more policy uh, directed reason, which is of course, as I've suggested, and as we'll see, um, levels of offending are quite high. Um, within this group of people that they're, they're what some police officers might call frequent flyers. They have very high levels of contact with the police. So there are very good policy reasons for understanding what kind of police activity might be best suited for dealing with or addressing or at least minimizing the behavior, uh, the, behavior the, the, the offending behavior of some of the people at least within this particular group. Within this study, um, we also want to add two, two further levels. There could be many more. We wanted to add, look at two other, other, what we think are probably quite important factors. Um, the first of which is, is something that summarizes kind of all the other things that may be affecting people's offending behavior or their compliance behavior. Which we're, and we're looking at what we might, what we think, I, well, what I think at least, is probably the most proximate of those nearest to people's behaviors, which is their personal morality in relation to the particular crimes involved. So the reason here, the argument would be something like the reason why most people obey most laws most of the time is that they think that the behaviors prescribed by law are morally wrong. They don't want to do things that they find morally wrong. Uh, and I think in a general sense, it's very interesting and important um, to look at the effect of police activity or perceptions of police activity on people's behaviors while controlling for another factor that you think is probably really important in those behaviors, which we can call morality. There are, of course, a whole host of other things that we could put into the model, but I think morality probably sums up a lot of those things quite nicely. The second thing we want to look at in this paper, and this is probably a bit more interesting um, for, in terms of, of the messages here, and um, we want to look at the nature of the behaviors involved. So procedural justice theory usually treats, and it's not alone in this, of course, it usually treats crime as an undifferentiated uh, behavior. So it treats all of them regularly in procedural justice studies, you'll see a scale of offending or a scale of compliance that brings students together, for example, people's self-reported offending behaviors across a whole range of different crime types. And it says these are basically all some sense the same thing. That in a general sense doesn't seem particularly plausible. People might very well have different relationships, if you like, with different crime types. They may very well have a different relationship with, offend, uh, with traffic offending than they would with burglary or robbery. And this differentiation of the crime type seems particularly important when you're dealing with homeless people um, because they're committing some crimes literally to survive, as we'll see. And they may very well have a very different relationship, again, if you want to use that word, in relation to those crimes as they will with other more standard, other forms of offending that aren't so closely associated with what it's like to live on the street. So in this study, one of the things we differentiate between different types of crime to look to see if procedural justice legitimacy pathway has an effect on compliance and to look to see if the effectiveness deterrence pathway has an effect on compliance. So all of that can be summarized in four research questions, which really um, guide uh, the analysis I'm gonna talk about in a minute. And so first, does police activity shape compliance through procedural justice and legitimacy? And second, if it does, is statistical effect of procedural justice and or legitimacy vary in relation to different crime types? So most interestingly, importantly, do people think about um, crime types most closely associated with life on, the, life on the streets differently to the way they think about other crime types? Third, do, does police activity affect compliance by demonstrating effectiveness and generating a perceived risk of sanction, the kind of deterrence pathway? Uh, and fourth, if so, does any statistical effect of risk of sanction vary in relation to different types of offending? So one way of thinking about this is, are people differentially deterrable in relation to different types of crime? Again, with particular reference to the social, social and economic situation of the people that we're dealing with in this study. So the data we have here is from a survey that, that Arabella um, conducted uh, in February, March 2020, so she got it in just before lockdown, and she managed to set, collect what is essentially kind of a pretty standard procedural justice theory questionnaire um, from 200 people, 200 homeless people 
um, living in London. She collected these questionnaires on, on, on the street. People filled them in with pen and paper. Um, most of this was in kind of northwest London area. I should say the, the, these guys here uh, were participants in, participants in her ethnographic work, and we don't know whether they responded to the survey or not, of course, because it was all anonymous. Um, as I say, the survey is a pretty standard procedural justice theory survey. We have me measures of perceptions of the police, so perceptions of police procedural justice, and um, perceived police legitimacy across dimensions of normative alignment and duty to bear the kind of things again that Tiago was just talking about. We actually had two different sets of measures of police effectiveness. Um, we have measures of police effectiveness in, in a general sense, how effective you think the police are responding to emergencies, dealing with crime and providing order and so forth, and measures of effectiveness in relation to the specific experiences of homeless people, so how effective they thought police were at policing them again in a kind of a relatively instrumental deterrence based bent to those kinds of questions we have measures of compliance behaviors or offending again it's the same side it is two uh, it's, uh, uh, two different sides of the same coin. Um, we have different crime types, which can be loosely um, based into mundane or low level crimes, like shoplifting, um, crimes specific to, to living on the street, such as begging, uh, drinking alcohol in places where it's prohibited, um, and what you could call high level compliance, and more serious forms of offending, robbery, burglary, and violence against the person, that kind of thing. We also have measures of perceived risk of sanction. So if you committed this crime, do you think that you would get caught for doing so and punished? Um, by the police and, and morality. How wrong do you think this particular um, behaviour is? So 15 different crime types were measured across those three different measures. So, so self-reported uh, behaviour, um, a perceived deterrence, perceived risk of sanction, uh, and, and self and morality or immorality of the act. And they fell quite nicely in kind of factor analysis into three groups, which I've already suggested. So we had low level criminal activities, buying, selling goods, shoplifting, vandalism, cannabis, between a third and a half of our respondents were engaging in those types of offending, uh, often or sometimes they reported. We had street population specific crimes, the kind of crimes associated with um, being homeless, drinking alcohol on the street in prohibited areas, begging, rough sleeping, using spice or heroin, which are two drugs particularly associated with the homeless community in London. And around half of our respondents were sometimes or often engaging in those kinds of behaviours. And then we had more serious or high level criminal activities, burglary, robbery, theft of theft from the person and so forth. Um, uh, and around you know, 20, 25% of respondents reported those kinds of behaviours as well. So one of the real benefits and one of the, such a great piece of work by Arabella is this one of the few samples we really have certainly from the UK um, within a procedural justice context of people who are reporting really high levels of offending we usually don't have anything like this level of offending in the samples we, we tend to collect from the general population for example so our analysis plan proceeded like this we tested three separate models of compliance one for each of these different levels of offending so low level street population specific uh, and high level, more serious forms of offending. And then in these models, we, we did the kind of classic procedural justice thing. We compared and contrasted a procedural justice association with crime or compliance. So direct and indirect pathways from procedural justice to legitimacy to compliance. That's on the left-hand side of the model. Um, on the right-hand side, we had the pathways from effectiveness to deterrence and onto crime or compliance. That's testing the kind of deterrence-based model of policing. And then we have morality as an additional, essentially, control variable. So we're looking at the marginal effect of police activity on people's self-reported offending when we condition for the, what we suspect would be a really strong link between personal morality and offending, which is actually what we find. So if you look at the results in, in, in terms of the left-hand side of the model, kind of the pursuit of justice legitimacy effects, and we're asking here, do the police generate compliance by acting procedurally fairly, generating legitimacy, and if so does the effect of, of procedural justice vary in relation to the three different types of offending? So the first two research questions, the answer to these questions are no and no. So none of the three models, do we find any association between procedural justice and legitimacy and offending? This is unlike what you would find in a procedural justice analysis of a sample from the general population. Um, we did find a really strong link between procedural justice and legitimacy. So when people in our sample um, felt that police behaved with procedural justice, they were much more likely to grant legitimacy to the police. It's just that link then from procedural justice and legitimacy to compliance seems to be missing in this particular context. When we go to the right hand side of the model, looking at the deterrence based model, uh, the deterrence based model of policing, as we're asking here, do the police motivate compliance by generating a sense they are effective, provide a credible risk of sanction? And if so, does that 
are people differentially deterrable? Does the association between deterrence and, and, and offending vary um, by the type of crime involved? Or is compliance higher when people think they're going to be deterred, in when people think they're going to be caught and sanctioned in relation to some crimes uh, more than others? Um, and what we find is, is some evidence of that. So, there, so if we look at the association between effectiveness and deterrence and low-level crimes, there's no significant association. If we look at the association between effectiveness, deterrence, and more serious forms of offending, there's no association. But in relation to the street population specific crimes, the kinds of crimes that this group were committing either to survive on the street, to so begging, rough sleeping, or to deal with the situation in which they found themselves drinking on the street, using drugs like spice and heroin. If respondents felt that they were more likely to get caught and sanctioned for those behaviors, they were less likely to report and doing them. So it seems there is some evidence here of a, of, of a differential deterrence effect. They weren't deterred from police, by police activity in relation to either minor types of crime, which they were quite often engaging in, or in relation to more serious types of crime, again, which quite a few of them were engaging in, but they were deterrable in relation to those crimes specific to the situation in which they find themselves living on the street, the kinds of things they were doing to survive. Police activity did deter them from that kind of activity to some extent. And finally, just to look at the control variable, um, we find really strong, significant and consistent links between personal morality um, and, and all three measures, all three aspects of crime or offending with measures in this study. And I don't think that's any surprise. And that really would that is very, very similar to what you would find in a more general sample of people. You find this very strong link between morality and self reported offending behaviour. So what does all that mean? Well, we think one of the things that we've done here, um, you can put it this way, um, is identify a, a structural limit to procedural justice theory. So the relational concerns that are wrapped up in this association between procedural justice legitimacy and, and compliance behavior in this case, um, don't seem to function, they seem to be ruptured. Um, by the context in which these individuals find themselves. Essentially, they can't attend to their relationship with the police and with the groups the police represent because they need to offend to survive. And that offending, that, that need to survive trumps, if you like, the, the, the need to fit into the group, the need to, to obey, obey its rules, the reciprocal duty the legitimizing authority places on you to then obey by, abide by the laws itself. Those things are just ruptured by the, situ the social and economic circumstances these individuals find themselves in. Second, we find some evidence that deterrent-based policing strategies may promote com compliance, may dampen offending within this group um, in relation to what you might call basically vagrancy laws. So the kinds of activity they were very frequently engaging in, um, they were deterrable from that activity to some extent by, by police presenting a credible risk um, of sanction. Um, but more widely, deterrence-based policing policies seem to have very little purchase on the wider offending behavior um, of this group, of which, again, they were engaging in quite a lot of this behaviour as well. So another way of putting this is people didn't read across from their day to day experiences of police being policed as homeless people. They didn't read across that into other forms of offending they might be they might be engaging in. Um, so I think the basic conclusion here is that for this group of regular customers of police, um, neither approach of police to policing really works. There's really not very much evidence here there's anything the police can do, at least in this kind of dichotomy that we've set up. There's really very little evidence there's anything the police can do here to really fundamentally shift um, the offending behaviour of this group of individuals who, again, you know, to stress, were offending quite a lot at the time we interviewed them, at least. Which means, of course, consequently, that the real solution to the problems um, confronted by this group, and of course the problems that they also um, couldn't, they also uh, make in terms of their offending behaviour, is going to be a non-policing one. I think, you know, and that's kind of in a sense blindingly obvious. Um, but I think this really does tap into some of the current debates about um, de-policing, about that, at least about the need to provide other forms of service provision to people in, in this kind of socially extreme situations, because there really isn't very little the police can do to fundamentally shift their behaviours, or not even fundamentally shift their behaviours, shift their behaviours in terms of promoting compliance in a more situational sense, perhaps. I think one of, one of the things that just to conclude, what, what 
what those different approaches would need to do is, is to treat these individuals as just the ordinary people that they are. So just to stress everything else in this model looks, in, to, from a procedural justice perspective, everything else looks very much like we would find in, in, in any other model, the procedural justice model of any other sample conducted in, this, in, in, in the UK. These are, these are not really unusual people in any other way that they find themselves in a situation where they have to offend or need to defend to survive physically and mentally. And it's that which breaking the, the links between social justice legitimacy uh, uh, and compliance and finding other ways to interact with them, other ways to deal with them and that activate their sense of they are just like everyone else in society would probably be the most effective way to deal with their offending behavior long-term. So that's the end of that. I'm sorry about the, uh, the technical uh, glitches at the beginning now. I hope I've done Arabella's paper some form um, uh, some form of justice, and I'm very happy to take questions when we get to that later on. Back to you, Steve. That's great. Thank you, Ben. A really interesting uh, presentation there, so thank you for that. Um, and, and on time, so excellent. Uh, so uh, what we'll do is uh, bring in a, a justice now and for our uh, final paper, uh, Moral Context to Procedural Injustice Effects on Public Cooperation with the Police. So, Justice, if I can um, invite you to bring your presentation up. And I'll pass over to you. I think you might be on mute now, Justin. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Great. Okay. Oh, Great. thank you very much for the chance to uh, be with you today. I'm really grateful uh, for that. And I would like to discuss a paper that I'm working on at the moment, which is um, in looking at procedural justice and its relationship or its effects on cooperation with the police. How much does uh, this relationship vary across moral context? And I'm looking at two moral contexts in, in particular, which is um, context in which um, there are if you like, anti-police or pro-police moral sentiments. And then of course, the other one being relational uh, um, uh, uh, proximity between uh, suspected offenders and potential collaborators uh, with the police. So I think as uh, some of you know, uh, this is my uh, approach to the question of legitimacy in policing. I view it as, um, a multi-dimensional uh, notion comprising at least these elements, uh, police lawfulness, effective use of police authority, procedure justice, and of course, uh, distributive justice. Um, today, I'm interested in just the element of procedure justice, which as um, we know, has attracted a lot of attention. And I think Tyler and uh, Tracy Mears uh, summarized what I mean by procedural justice in this way, that when people interact with the authorities, whether they are police officers or judges or probation officers, they care a lot about how they are treated. And they are particularly interested in these four aspects of their experience, whether they have a voice, whether the decision maker or the police officers came across as people who were impartial or neutral, uh, the extent to which they treat people with respect and dignity, and then of course, whether they care for the well-being of, of citizens or not. And the uh, correlational evidence, and in some ways, in some ways, the experimental evidence that we have suggests that when people have these experiences of being treated fairly, it tends to induce in them uh, a willingness to uh, cooperate with the police, by which we mean supply information uh, about crime uh, to the police. But of course, a recent uh, review of the evidence uh, suggests that, um, would, I mean, yes, there is some relationship, but talking about causal influences between procedure justice and cooperation remains a little bit of, um, um, still a bit, a bit weak. And, of course, that suggests that we've got to try to explore further uh, precisely how these two issues are, are related. So we see here from the Goodfellas um, that 
uh, I mean, I think really, really interesting challenge for procedural justice research in that here you have someone who has, if you like, commitment to different normative orders. The state is pulling him uh, in one side that he should cooperate. He has information about criminal behavior and it's his obligation to assist the authorities to solve that crime. But on the other hand, there are these commitments that he has encouraging him to remain committed to those two, uh, as he said, greatest thing that uh, you, you could learn in life. Never rat on your friends, always keep your mouth shut. So the challenge is whether treating such a person procedurally fairly can break this strong commitment, if you like, this code of silence to which he is uh, uh, committed. And it's not just a fictional thing. I think recently we've seen with the police in London making the point that it's very hard for them to get information from people whom they know to have this information to be able to help the police solve a, a crime. So three questions I'm interested in. Uh, first of course is the standard procedural justice question, which is whether treating people procedurally justly can induce a willingness to uh, support the police fight crime. But secondly, to try to see whether this relationship varies across what I describe as, if you like, pro-police and anti-police moral con uh, uh, context. And I will talk about that, a little bit about that further later. Then finally, to see whether, again, the relationship varies across relational uh, uh, distances between criminal suspects and people who have the information that the police are interested in. Uh, Justice, we're just losing the audio a little bit. I'm, I'm wondering if anything's happened at uh, your end no? in terms of the volume at all. Can you, uh, hello? Can you oh, that's me? better. Yeah, that's better. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. So this was uh, a community survey done uh, uh, in 2019, luckily before the virus came around, in two communities in, in, in Accra, Ghana's national capital. Uh, low uh, income community and a middle class uh, area. So I had um, four researchers who went down to this community. This wasn't a, a perfect random, uh, randomly selected uh, communities as such. So they decided on a vantage point and then selected every other house uh, and uh, served uh, a, one experimental uh, condition to each household. So when they went into the households, normally in Ghana, you have multiple occupants and whoever was available and, and willing to participate, they would uh, serve that quest, uh, questionnaire to, to them. So there was one experimental condition per household, and we had 422 people uh, taking part. So these are the experimental conditions. So I will talk about, again, give you an example shortly. But here we have, uh, we designed a scenario in which um, someone who is alleged to have bought so, uh, a stolen property, uh, police went to his house to uh, arrest him. So we have a procedure justice condition in which the person is treated with respect, blah, blah, blah. Then the procedure injustice condition. And then we have procedure justice in the context of pro-police moral uh, sentiments. I will talk about that shortly. And then uh, the other one in anti-police moral uh, context and so forth. So here's an example of the procedure justice condition. So the guy is home, the police knock on his door. They say that in the, um, a phone that he bought the previous week was actually stolen from a robbery and that he needed to come uh, to go with the police uh, to the local st uh, station. But then we try to build in here the fact that the police had explained uh, the reasons for uh, the uh, detention. They had listened to him. They had showed care for, uh, for his well-being and treated him, he feels that he's been treated with respect. Then procedure injustice condition does exactly the opposite. And because of time, I don't want to uh, go into uh, that here. Then we have procedure justice in an anti-police moral context. So what we mean here is, so the relation that his friends, his family, they've been telling him that, or they've been telling the, uh, the individuals involved here that it's never their duty to uh, have uh, to support the police, they should have nothing to do with the police and so forth. But here, uh, that those background norms are 
in spite of those background norms, his individual experience is that is one of being treated with respect and dignity by, by the police. And then, of course, we have um, procedure justice occurring in a context in which the individual um, is encouraged to cooperate uh, with the police. So that's, that's the way that it, it, it goes. So I want to move quickly to the kind of questions that we ask. So after reading, each person reads only one of these uh, uh, scenarios. And then after the scenario, they have these questions to answer. One of them is that the police are, are looking for uh, a suspect. You have that information. Um, what we told them is someone who has uh, who is suspected of uh, engaging in, in, in an offense. And of course, in the typical uh, studies on procedure justice, the questions have always been about if you had information that someone, okay, a person of unspecified social relationship with a potential collaborator. And then we follow that by being specific that the person is a stranger, in another case, it's a, your friend's relative, and then of course, your own relative. So we wanted to find out whether uh, the willingness to cooperate will vary across these uh, different uh, uh, contexts. So first, let's look at, um, again, just comparing uh, procedure justice and injustice conditions across the different uh, relational distances. So for example, if you take here, this is where we suggest someone, so it's unspecified. And so we can see from here that those who were exposed to the procedure justice condition were significantly more likely to say they will cooperate with the police, they will supply the police with the information. And when you do a, a, a t-test, you find that uh, the magnitude of the difference was, was really high. I think it was uh, 0.9 or 1 uh, around those things. Then in the case of a stranger, if the suspect was a stranger, we can see here again, uh, our analysis showed uh, significant differences, acquaintance again, and all that. The only thing that differed was the effect sizes. So it was high in both um, unspecified relation and stranger situations, moderate when you are complying against um, uh, an acquaintance, but low at 3.30 uh, when it is a relative. So what we see here is that procedure justice does make a difference irrespective of the relational distances, but the magnitude of the difference that it makes varies across these uh, distances. The second thing we wanted, then we wanted to see whether um, cooperation, again, varies across the different moral contexts. So um, we are comparing, of interest in particular, is comparing procedure justice with all these other conditions. So when I talk about AMC, I mean anti-police moral context, pro-police moral context, and so forth. And here we find, I think, especially interesting is comparing the procedure justice condition with um, a pro-police moral context in which a person is treated unjustly, okay? So your friends, your family are telling you that uh, it's your duty to obey the police, to supply them with information, but your own experiences with the police um, have been unjust. You perceive them to be unjust. Now, we find that procedure justice has, uh, um, those who are exposed to the procedure justice condition were significantly more likely to cooperate with the police than those who were uh, exposed to procedure just injustice condition, even in the context of pro-police uh, moral sentiment. So it's not the fact that the environment encourages you to, to support the police, that is the issue your individual experiences is what appears to matter uh, uh, greatly. And then of course, we also find a, a similar thing that even when the context is anti-police, we see that procedure justice still has uh, quite a big impact on, on people's uh, willingness to cooperate. Now these findings for the unspecified relations plays out across, uh, play out across the others. So here, if the person, that the police require information, about whom the police require information is a stranger, we still find that at least the, if you compare procedure justice condition to a, a pro-police moral context in which your own experiences are unjust, 
procedure justice has a much more significant impact uh, and so forth. Okay. The findings, again, the similar thing when you're talking about acquaintances and then when you're talking about relatives. The only difference is that, again, the magnitude of the, dif uh, of the differences appears to be to vary across these contexts. We put all that in a regression model to see what might happen. And again, we see uh, the reference category is a procedure justice condition. So compared with those who were exposed to procedure justice condition, being procedurally, uh, having a procedurally unjust experience significantly lowers your willingness to cooperate with the police across these different relational uh, uh, situations, okay? So it didn't matter whether the person you were supplying information to the police about was a friend, was a friend's relative, your own relative or a stranger, procedure justice or procedure injustice lowers your willingness to do so, okay? Um, okay, all the others, again, compared with what we've, Hard from the uh, t-test, uh, the results are broadly similar. One interesting thing though, when you look at the adjusted uh, R squares is the differences in the, the, uh, the proportion of the dependent variable that is explained by these models. And we can see that in the case of complying, uh, cooperating against a relative, it only explains about 6% of the, of the variance, okay? Which seems to reinforce the differences in the uh, effect sizes that we reported, uh, I reported earlier. So yes, procedure justice matters across this context, but um, the, the weight appears to, uh, to be different. So what can we say? We can say, I think a couple of things, three things in particular. First, that consistent with the evidence from, um, from Tyler and from all these other, other studies, Procedure justice uh, can cause a greater willingness to cooperate with the police. We have seen that when people are treated with procedure, uh, procedure justice, they are more willing to cooperate with the police. When they experience the police as being abusive and disrespectful, that significantly lowers their willingness to cooperate uh, with the police. I think we can say more generally that uh, people have feel like a generalized commitment to uh, support the state. They, they're interested in social order for, for very obvious reasons. But it appears that their, their commitments are contingent or their co cooperation behavior is contingent on the particular experiences that they have uh, uh, with the police. Then when we talk about the moral sentiments, as I, uh, the moral context, as I've said, we have seen that even when the, the prevailing sentiments, even when the background uh, norms are as it were, anti-police, okay? In the way that is described in the US, they talk about uh, police cynicism. Even when the background norms are anti-police, we have seen that people are still willing to cooperate with the police if their individual experiences are, are positive. And of course, they are, more, they are less likely to do so when the experiences are, are, are negative. And I think this is consistent with what Monica Bell reports in her paper on situational trust. And one of the issues that she mentions, for example, uh, about how the strategies that people adopt, such that they're living in communities where uh, cynicism against the police is very strong, and yet they still call on the police uh, to deal with uh, problems in their neighborhoods. And one of the strategies she identifies is that of officer exceptionalism. And her point here is that when people um, have positive experiences with their neighborhood police officer, that appears to be strong enough to influence their willingness to call the police when they, uh, they need them to address uh, problems in their, in their neighborhood. So, and I think this evidence is uh, consistent with that. Uh, then of course, we see that, as I said, yes, Procedure justice matters across the different relational uh, distances between potential collaborators and the suspects that are of interest to the police. But we also saw that the 
the effect size appears to vary as you move as the uh, as you move away from your uh, relatives acquaintances to dealing with with strangers and others who are unspecified and i think on the basis of that we can potentially think about a concentric circle right uh, with family relations at the center acquaintances uh, if you like far removed from that and then with strangers at the at the very periphery and that the ability or the potential for procedure justice to influence cooperation would increase as you move from the center of this concentric uh, concentric circle and i think this um are these are findings that are potentially interesting sorry <laughs> set a timer findings that are potentially interesting in looking at the current context of um i think when we see the reports about uh, abuses in religious uh, institutions code of silence within the police service dealing with organized crime groups and so forth and of course domestic violence context where sometimes some potential collaborators are unwilling to to supply information to the police because of the relational proximity that they have to potential uh, suspects thank you thank you very much Thank you, Justice. Um, and I think that concludes um, three really interesting presentations that um, have lots of different focuses on, on legitimacy um, and how we can uh, consider them in a variety of different contexts. Um, we've had quite a few questions. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to present the questions to the panel. So if you could all turn your cameras and mics on, uh, I'll do them in order of uh, the questions as they arrived. Um, and um, and then uh, if you could uh, give your, your view, that would be great. Uh, so the first question that, that, that came through was, can any of the panel uh, please comment on the following? For student police officers who are successfully taught and understand both procedural justice and police legitimacy, can we expect improving policing and society outcomes? Uh, I'll, go, I'll go first. Um, I mean, yes. <laughs> I, th I think one. I think one of the um, one of the other um, questions. I think it was was it Susan? Uh, it was yeah. One of the other questions. Um, we talk about procedural justice in, as a good in itself, and and I think that's the the basic starting point here, right? Right. It's it's all very well to say that procedural justice um, purchases compliance or purchases cooperation, and, and those are obviously important policy outcomes. Um, but the fundamental issue here is that is that that's how you should treat people um, as often as you possibly can. And that, and that should be foundational to our understanding of what good policing is. Um, and in a case, in, in a sense, it's serendipitous that that actually it leads on to, to cooperation and compliance and so forth further down the line. But, but, but of course, because it does, um, that makes policing both kind of ethically better and more effective in the long run. I mean, this has always been Tom Tyler's basic claim that, that that's the way we should do policing. But if you do policing that way, in the long run, you're going to get greater levels of cooperation and compliance. I guess, I guess the, the slight proviso, and it's not really a proviso, but I think certainly what I was saying, and I think some interpretations of what Justice has just said is, is also very clearly in the kind of original theorising around procedural justice. The claim has never been that it, it works for everyone, quote unquote, works for everyone. Um, the claims would rather been that, that sufficient numbers of people respond positively in the ways that we've been talking about to pursue justice in terms of cooperation and compliance. Um, that frees up police resource and time um, to deal with the with the minority who don't respond quote unquote positively to pursue justice. And that's a really important um, element of the kind of policy translation here. So it's not that, you, you know, it's, it's not a magic wand. It's not like all you've got to do is treat people fairly and all of a sudden compliance will be 100% and everyone's going to cooperate with the police. No. I mean, first, A, you have to earn that cooperation and compliance. And B, even, even when you've earned it among the majority of people, there'll be some for who, who continue to offend, can, to continue to refuse to cooperate. And you need to find other strategies to deal with those individuals. It's just you've got more time to do that now because most people are, are complying, cooperating, um, um, 
because you've retreated them appropriately because they grant you legitimacy. So, so I mean, which is a very long-winded answer to the question, but I think I think it should do. Of course, the trick is how do you teach these things appropriately and get people to internalize the teaching. Um, yeah, I I would uh, share everything that uh, uh, Ben has said. Um, uh, the correlational evidence we have, uh, and I think even at a really qualitative level that treating people with respect and dignity can certainly improve uh, the outcomes that the questioner has. has. But uh, it's also an ethical issue. Uh, and I think sometimes there's a tendency um, to overlook that ethical issue that as police institutions, they have a moral duty to treat citizens with respect, with dignity and so forth. And, and I think we, we get into a really dangerous territory if we begin to think that it's not about how you do things. I mean, it's not about what you do, it's about how you do it, right? Um, so don't worry, uh, the system is fixed. We're gonna find him guilty anyway, but we'll give him enough time to, to tell his side of the story with treatment with dignity and respect. No, I, I think uh, that will be a mistake. And we see that very early on, uh, in the 90s, uh, late 80s, uh, 90s, there were already critiques of procedure justice that tries to draw our attention to this aspect, that we need not to overlook the structural injustices in society and the unfair outcomes that some groups are, 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 do often receive uh, from justice institutions by merely focusing on, on, on processes. Thank you, Justice. Yeah, I have very little to add after uh, everything that Ben and just said um, already. I will simply say that I uh, completely agree with everything they said. Uh, uh, and just to add a little more, I would also say like it's a, the, the answer is a very big yes, of, of course, but uh, uh, it's, it's also a very tricky question because on the one hand, we have uh, an, a very large amount of evidence, specifically correlational and associational evidence that uh, uh, Procedural justice policing is associated with uh, uh, police legitimacy and associated with more willingness to cooperate with the police, uh, uh, voluntary compliance with the law and so on. Uh, but of course, this question has a, a causal uh, aspect hidden uh, uh, underneath it, right? When, when we say, can we expect improving uh, uh, policing and societal outcomes? We're talking about a causal relationship. And of course, talking about causal relationships is very difficult. Uh, but even that, uh, I would still be confident because we have uh, uh, increasingly, we have more and more causal evidence that those things are also related, that those correlations are not spurious correlations, they're actually uh, uh, orderly related. Uh, but the, the, the difficulty here is that when we're talking about the, those things being causally related, there being an, a causal effect of procedural justice uh, 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 on legitimacy, on legitimacy, of legitimacy on compliance and, and cooperation, we're talking about an average effect. So we're talking about a, a very large group of people. We're talking about on average that there is an effect uh, in society. That doesn't mean that there will, there will be an effect as been said on every single case, on every single individual. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, whenever uh, uh, police officers treat citizens with procedural fairness in every single police interaction, you can expect that specific citizen to instantly uh, increase their scores of legitimacy of the police and start cooperating with the police. That's not how it works. And that's not what the evidence suggests. And theoretically, that's not what the theory suggests either. What we're talking about here is uh, on, uh, on average, there seems to be an effect and there will be outliers for all, all the sides, but on average, yes, the answer would be yes. I think the next question that, that came up uh, is kind of related to this, where, um, where where the person presented the question said the notion of legitimacy e equals compliance by the use of deterrence ignores some of the structural issues across society that have led to people becoming long term homeless. Um, and, uh, you know, the, really, the question kind of focuses on uh, the nature of social services and pointing to homeless charities like, you know, Centrepoint. Uh, having a more recognised uh, that, that a positive, holistic approach is required to reduce homelessness and bespoke packages uh, can be created to promote independence. So really saying as a police service, how, how can we reconcile our approach away from criminalisation towards this more, you know, more positive approaches, if, if considered appropriate? So uh, I was wondering if anybody has a comment on, on, on that kind of uh, position. 
Um, I'll, I'll go first again, since it was that, that paper. Um, um, I mean, I, th I think I think policing people living on the streets is is one of those issues that create a, a particular set of challenges for police organisations because it's the kind of thing they get um, um, asked slash forced to do because of the very public nature of the offending committed by those individuals and groups and 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 the desire for 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 example local businesses or for example the local council or whoever it is um, to invoke the police and 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 generate a criminal justice response to those behaviors and I think and, and again you know what what we found in that paper is in, in some senses entirely unsurprising to anyone who's ever fought for more than five minutes about that area is that it's never going to work and that that is just not going to address the problems confronted by those individuals or the reasons for their offending um, but nevertheless, please continuously get asked to do it and, and feel in some sense forced to do it, I suspect. Um, so I think one one policy lesson there might be um, as a police organization, um, be be stronger. Be, be you know, say say to the people seeking to invoke a police response decision, there isn't a police response to this situation. We need to get other service providers in to step in and do the things that we can't do because these individuals are not going to stop offending. Um, as a result of whatever we do, probably, um, because they need to offend, to offend because of the situation in which they find themselves. And I recognise that's quite a big ask for most police organisations. So I guess the softer version of that is to get um, even more clever um, in, in, in terms of working with other service providers, um, instigating some kind of social service response or whatever it is, and then stepping back very quickly. Um, to, 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 to let those other service providers step in. Of course, the challenge there is those other service, service providers have, have been attenuated massively because of austerity. So all, all of this taps into that whole debate about how do you address pe social problems that cause crime um, when the, the, the other solutions to those problems, the effective solutions to those problems have withered on the vine due to 10 years, 10 years of austerity. And how, do, how as a police organisation, do, do you operate... Um, effectively and ethically in that space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, again, just to add to that, I think uh, on Ben's last point, um, and we have seen some police uh, forces begin to do that. So Merseyside Police, uh, the Chief Constable, uh, I think a couple of months ago, was talking about uh, the need for police to invest, I mean, the need for an investment to deal with the social inequalities in Merseyside. And that, that was, um, as you put it, tackling the root causes of some of these problems was an important issue rather than just focusing on arresting people and, and so forth. So I think it's a conversation that needs to be had, that uh, police chiefs need to be, I think, more forceful in, in pushing for some of those um, uh, interventions to deal with the root causes. And I think another thing to say, and this is a general point, that of course, when we, when we are discussing legitimacy, we can always approach it from uh, at least uh, two perspectives. One, of course, is what uh, we have been discussing, at least on the basis of the evidence, about how procedure justice or legitimacy might influence a, a behavior. The other one is uh, the more normative perspective that we find in political theory, in, in moral philosophy, legitimacy as uh, a tool of social critique. And, and, and in that sense, it, it draws our attention um, to some of the injustices in society. I remember having a, a, a seminar in prison, uh, in prison uh, we had this uh, learning together program and we go to prisons to, to, to have seminars. And after a, a brief talk, uh, one of the prisoners said, how could you be teaching legitimacy with a smile? Right? You, you should, I mean, your attention should immediately be drawn given what you're saying to all these injustice, injustices, unfairness and so forth in, in society. And that's one way we can look at it, uh, that it's a lens through which we begin to critique some of these uh, issues uh, in society, including homelessness and, 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 and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Justice.
Uh, and again, very, very little to add uh, after uh, Ben and Justice and, and disclaimer beforehand that uh, um, I've never studied homelessness in particular, but I um, was very curious about Ben's presentation on that. Uh, but well, what I have some experience in studying is disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, um, as, I, as I talked about, and, and there might be some parallels. And, uh, the very little that I have to add here to this discussion is uh, there is a very common critique uh, when it comes to, to marginalized populations on how do you expect single uh, uh, interactions uh, to alter pre-existing attitudes, to alter pre-existing uh, uh, to, to uh, pre attitudes that are built on a uh, historical legacy of police mistreatment and so on. So if we're talking about communities that are very used to historically being mistreated by the police and mistreated by the state and the legal institutions, how 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 does procedure how can procedure justice uh, alone solve that? Um, and the, the way I uh, I usually address that question is that it's right. It is naive to believe that simply uh, uh, treating people with respect and making high quality decisions will will alter uh, uh, all those pre-existing attitudes that are built on historical legacy of, 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 of police mistreatment. Uh, but those are those things are also being built. This is, these are dynamic relationships, right? So if these people have a cumulative effect of police uh, uh, injustice, uh, we might also start to have a cumulative impact of, proceed, of, of police justice. So maybe one single interaction won't have an impact and won't, won't make any difference. Maybe the second one will, maybe the third one will, and at some point uh, the will will change, right? So. Uh, at some point, the idea of, of procedural justice and how I see it is we're not talking about specific policies and interactions. We're talking about a cumulative effect when people expect to be treated fairly by the police. And that includes marginalized uh, communities. The, the task is tougher for, for some communities. Um, I would guess that the, tough is even, uh, uh, the task is even tougher for, uh, uh, for the homeless population. But I, I, I would say that the approach is the same. Um, at some point, there will be a cumulative effect as well. Thank you, Tiago. That's 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 great. Thank you. Uh, three good views. Uh, I had a couple more questions that were aimed at you, Ben, but you've answered one of them already. Um, and the second one was, uh, how did you identify the moral codes of the homeless people you surveyed? Um, we lit really literally asked them, how wrong do you think each of these behaviours are? So for e for each crime type, there was there was how often you do it, do you do it? Um, how likely do you think you are to get caught if you do it? And how wrong do you think it is to do it? Um, and then, and then the, the, the morality scale is, is built up across it. And of course, it, we cross-sectional survey in, in Justice and, and Tiago have already touched upon this. Um, it's just correlation. And you'd expect a really strong correlation between people saying it's wrong to do something and reporting doing it. Because, you know, <laughs> and, and in your samples, was there any evidence of other le legitimacy payoffs amongst your sample cooperation for information um, that was distinct from the legal compliance? Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad someone brought that up because I forgot to say it. So, so elsewhere in, in the survey, elsewhere in the sample, um, we find um, pathways that look exactly like they would in any other procedural justice survey we've ever done in this country so so links between procedural justice and 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 um, identification with superordinate social categories for example um associations between procedural justice legitimacy and propensity to cooperate with the police look exactly the same so 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 it's not that that the individuals in this sample didn't in a sense care about procedural justice because they did and it and emerges from arabella's qualitative research as well they they took that you know it was important to them that the police treated them this way um it, you know some you know, it's nice to be treated fairly if, if nothing else um um it's just specifically in the relationship between procedural justice legitimacy and compliance that's where the rupture comes because because the the reasons for their offending are not relational the reasons for their offending are instrumental um if we if i don't offend i'm going to starve or my life is going to be so miserable i can't de de deal with it um, and, and, and elsewhere, the relational bits of procedural justice kick back in, if you like, which is why, which is why I was trying to suggest at the end that, that if it, within the lim very, very, very limited context of the survey that we fielded, um, there's quite a lot to suggest that, that if you took those individuals out of that context, um, the relational aspects of procedural justice would, would start working even more like they do in, in, and in other kind of samples that we've we've produced, which because again, it's it's the it's the context in which they find themselves, which is driving this, not the kinds of person or people that they are. 
<laughs> we thank you, Ben. Thank you. Um, I've got a question that's directed towards justice. And, and the question is, uh, do you see more serious crimes influencing the level of cooperation? For example, would a father provide information about his son who is involved in a serious crime over the son's involvement in a lower level crime? Mm. I, I guess it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say yes or no, but I go back to uh, Chago's point about averages. So I think if you had in, in a, a sample on the average, you might find that a father would be likely to assist the police in a more serious crime. That might be influenced by um, his experiences with the police, but also probably his own uh, moral convictions about um, some of these offenses. So mm -hmm. I think that's a point to be made that on the average, you will find that. Um, and it might, of course, depend on um, the proportion of people who are willing to, 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 to do that. But I think the overall point then is that procedure justice is just one of the resources, if you look at it that way, available to, to the police. There are others in, in the toolkits of the police that might influence. Them. And we are think in real life, we know of cases where people have volunteered, their family member had committed a crime and they themselves have encouraged them to go to the police to report the offense uh, uh, to the police. That that would, would certainly happen. Great, thank you. Uh, and I have another question, which I think, you know, be of interest to all of you, which is, um, would more rigorous police, regu uh, more rigorous regulation of police conduct and more effective discipline by sacking officers and charging them with criminal offenses improve legitimacy? And I think that kind of relates to, you know, sometimes there's criticism of, you know, police officers rarely find themselves convicted of the most serious offences. Um, you know, or certainly there's a, there's, a, there's a belief of that and, and how that relates to legitimacy. Okay. Do, do you, Thiago, do you want to go? I should, I, I'm happy to go. First. Okay. <laughs> um, I think, Sunny, if you, if you look at it broadly as an issue of police uh, unethicality or police misconduct, police corruption, we're tackling that improve the legitimacy of the police. I think our immediate response must be yes, it would on average improve the attitudes of, uh, of people towards, uh, towards the police. Because what does police misconduct do? It means that uh, the police are more likely to be planting evidence on, on suspects, to be denying them uh, exculpatory evidence. They are taking bribes. They are engaged in extrajudicial killings in some cases. And as we've seen more recently, they engage in sexual violence, okay, with um, with all the cases. That, so, addressing those problems is one that we should expect to lead to an improvement in in uh, the legitimacy of the police within local communities. Of course, the challenge with misconduct it's how you <laughs> you are able to get the, the the information, the intelligence to be able to uh, punish or sanction the individual officers. So we are told about the strong code of uh, silence among police officers, such that even where they have information that their colleagues are en engaged in misconduct for various reasons, they are reluctant to supply that information uh, uh, to the police, uh, to the uh, internal affairs or whatever that uh, might be, which then allows such officers to continue in their, in their behavior. So I think the, the challenge is not so much um, an issue of well, um, severe sanctioning of police officers or controlling the behavior of police officers improve public perceptions of legitimacy. It's more a question of what might work in encouraging officers to, do, to provide the information that would allow the authorities to deal with uh, officers who uh, engage in such misconduct and of, therefore creating an environment of greater ethical behavior within police uh, departments. This is, this is a really interesting question because uh, it's actually the same question that we've been trying to, to address but applied to a population. So basically what we have here is um, a group of people, in this case, police officers uh, dealing with an authority, in this case, uh, uh, the police institution. Uh, and then that authority uh, wants 
that group of people to behave appropriately uh, and if they don't how should we promote how should we what should we do to encourage such behavior um, and then the question was if we simply increase punishment against those police officers who engage in police misconduct will that encourage them to well to be better um, that is the same question as in as in making if we if we increase uh, um, punishment will people comply more with the law and so on so we can we can address that question in the through the same lens uh, of deterrence and legitimacy uh, of course uh, um, I, I don't think anyone would be as naive to suggest that there is no no place for deterrence and no place for punishment in any circumstances that there will be and there has to be um, uh, such a place uh, and and maybe in this specific case uh, of police complaint uh, this could be this could be an alternative, but there could also be the other the other route, and they could work in parallel, trying to simply uh, uh, promote uh, uh, procedural justice within the the police institutions and trying to 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 increase police officers' uh, beliefs in their own uh, uh, in their legitimacy uh, uh, as as representatives of legal authority. Um, of course, both Ben and Justice have uh, uh, brilliant works on 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 the idea of self legitimacy, but that could be one way. Uh, where this could, could be improved. In another study uh, uh, that I was, uh, I wasn't conducting the study, but, but I was uh, I was involved with in Brazil, we surveyed uh, 300 police officers in Brazil and we asked questions about like how, how they dealt with their own authority basically. And, and of course, again, as we said repeatedly, it was a cross-sectional survey. We were just assessing correlations. Uh, uh, it was very difficult to draw very, uh, to draw conclusive uh, um, statement from that, but basically what we found is that whenever they uh, they were dealing with their own authority, with, they were dealing with their superiors via uh, procedurally just ways. When they when they that that would increase their the, uh, their views of self legitimacy, they would believe in their own authority uh, in a way. So that could be one, by no means the only, but that could be one way to to deal with those kind of situations as well. Thank you, Tiago. Yeah. Yeah, just to say, yeah, I'm gonna agree with everything that's just been said. I think I think have to take take the kind of um the the first and third clauses of the of the question. So would more rigorous regulation of police conduct and more effective discipline improve legitimacy? Um I've always suspected, or I've not seen any kind of direct evidence for this. It would be great if someone could could think of a study to test this idea. Um that there's a there's a curvy linear relationship between those two two variables. So if, if you live in a country where the police are really corrupt um, and, and really ineffective and inefficient, um, I would imagine that, that dealing with that corrupt corruption is kind of the basic foundational box to improving legitimacy. And you ju you've just got to do it before you do anything else because people are just going to believe anything else you're doing. Um, but as 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 you as you go to countries where where police organisations are less corrupt, I mean I don't know if there's any police organisations that's free from corruption. But when you move to less countries where police organisations are less corrupt, I, I would expect the the kind of benefit to dealing with corruption and and, and misconduct in terms of legit legitimacy to attenuate. Because the idea that that police organisations are just generally okay has kind of circulated within society for long enough um, that people aren't, aren't attending to an individual instances of, of malpractice and misconduct and, and corruption. And when, when they do notice them, they discount them, possibly inappropriately. So, so another way of, of looking at that would be to think back to, to the to the UK of the 1950s and 60s. Um, where, where trust and legitimacy, as far as we know, were really, really high, and policing was riddled with corruption and malpractice, it's because people didn't believe it could be true, because they thought they had the best police organisation in the world. So, mm -hmm. so, so, which is all, again, a, a quite a long-winded way of saying, I, I would expect the relationship between those kinds of variables to actually be quite complicated, yeah. and it would never be just a question of, well, we'll get rid of corruption, and all of a sudden we'll have we'll have high legitimacy well perhaps high legitimacy enables corruption because people are looking elsewhere and turning a blind eye yeah yeah thank you it's re really useful responses there uh, moving on this this one's directed at justice but i think it could be equal, equally addressed to all of you uh which is how centric is community policing police legitimacy within communities um okay so um i think one thing we've um, learned from the community policing uh, literature, certainly the evidence, is that it's important in building confidence and building legitimacy. 
Um, and certainly if you look at the recent um, uh, review of the evidence in uh, David Weisberg's uh, book, Policing uh, Innovations also, that, that point is, is clearly made that when you have, um, because in community policing, we have an attempt to bridge a gap between the police and the community. And we doing so by uh, having police officers um, uh, listen to the community, explain things to the community, work with the community to identify whatever uh, safety or social order needs there might be in those local communities and, and then working together to address them. So already you have in that uh, an attempt to essentially build legitimacy within those communities. And, and that the evidence does support that uh, contrary to the basis on which community policing was sold to us, which is crime prevention and so forth, it's actually working more in building confidence and, and legitimacy than it, it, it is in building, uh, uh, um, in reducing crime. But of course, um, and this goes back to Ben's, the point that Ben has just been making, that it does depend on, on, on the environment, uh, that if policing is unaccountable, if uh, what individual police officers are doing out there on the street is not something that supervisors know, if the community has a history of um, distrust in, in, in the police, what you have will be police officers out there in local communities abusing their authority in a way that will have uh, will be counterproductive to what we, we are seeking to do. Okay, And of course, we find in some cases, uh, I mean, if you're practicing community policing, the idea will be, for, for example, the police are living in that community. I think it will help. They, um, they're building relationships in those communities. And yet we find that sometimes there is a danger that the police become captured, as it were, by some forces within that environment, whether they are organized crime, whether they are powerful actors in that. So we find evidence of that from South Africa, for example, in Julia Hornberger's uh, work on human rights training and, and policing in South Africa, that um, you have religious leaders, you have other groups in local communities who essentially are having a disproportionate influence on the police. So while ultimately they might be able to improve the views of some sections of the community, they might actually be used against other uh, groups within that. So it, it's a little bit of a, a tricky uh, situation, but overall, the evidence suggests that it does improve confidence and legitimacy. Thank you, Justice. Um, yeah. I can move on. Sorry, Sorry. go on, uh, Tiago. No, 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 go on, go on. Uh, I've, got, I've got a few more questions, which I was going to try and get in. Um, uh, the next one um, is directed to Ben, and it, it says that um, in, in your conclusion, um, said that uh, procedural justice uh, could, could not lead to compliance because of the instrumental part uh, that violation of the law is essential to survival on the street. Then, for instance, in the case of white collar criminals, there are also likely to consider instrumental part of their interests are unlikely to follow the law based on procedural justice policing policy. Are there any studies tested that, that tested post uh, procedural justice against rational choice related context? And then the second part of that question is how do you think the response to would be different if you compared procedural justice to neutral treat treatment. Uh, so I've got to scroll down now. <laughs> uh, uh, rather than procedural injustice. So it's linking into um, uh, justice's point as well. Yeah, so, so, so Tina Murphy in particular has done a number of studies over the year looking at procedural justice effects in um, among tax offenders and, and people of that kind. Um, and she she tends to find very strong procedural justice and legitimacy effects on, on offending or variations offending among those groups. And I think um, I, th I, th I think that makes sense in terms of what I was saying, because if if one of the reasons why you find this link between procedural justice, legitimacy and compliance is because 
it, it, these relational factors. So, so one of the reasons why people don't offend is because they wish to maintain positive relations with um, groups to which they feel they belong and the, and the authorities of those groups. Um, you'd expect, again, on average, um, the need to maintain positive relationships with those kinds of groups to be stronger among middle class people because they've got more at stake in those relationships being ruptured. Whereas among the, 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 the people that Arabella was working with, they've got no irons in that fire. It doesn't matter to them. You know, that, that's not, that's not going to change the way that society views them. It's not going to change their relationship with these kind of with these kind of categories or with these institutions because they're already viewed as offenders by those categories and by those institutions. So, so the offending behavior isn't going to rupture anything for them. Whereas for middle class white collar offenders, you would expect, well, you might expect, this would be my hypothesis at least, um, that that because they've got more at stake in those relationships, procedural justice is even legitimacy is even more and even stronger. Um, predictor of compliance in those contexts and I think that tends to be what what Tina finds and she has published papers that directly compare and contrast kind of deterrence based deterrence based approaches to a white collar offending and, and tends to conclude that legitimacy procedural justice is a more consistent predictor of compliance behavior um, for the second question I think that's a question for Tiago actually because one of the papers in his PhD addressed specifically that question pretty much mm. Sorry, I got lost in that. What was the second question again? So, so if you compared procedural justice to neutral treatment rather than procedural injustice, that sounds like a lot like your contact paper. Yeah, so that's what that's what we did. So basically, for one of our for one of my papers by PhD uh, with Ben and John and, and Tina Murphy, uh, we, we we did a survey in Australia, national representative, and then it was a longitudinal survey, two waves, and then between the waves, we asked whether like uh, whether they had recently had any encounters with the police. Uh, and we asked about that encounter. So whether uh, a, a bunch of questions about the satisfaction with process and satisfaction with the outcome uh, of that encounter. And basically what we did is uh, 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 we, we did some statistical analysis to classify those encounters with the police. And we came up with basically four groups uh, of people among those who did have an encounter. Uh, Roughly speaking, those were negative, neutral, and positive encounters, or at least some way, uh, in a way, encounters that went worse than expected, as expected, and better than expected, uh, both in terms of procedural fairness and uh, outcomes satisfaction. Uh, and then we assessed the change in legitimacy and the change in perceptions of, of procedural fairness and, and, and effectiveness. And basically, what we found is a very symmetrical relationship overall. Uh, so. Uh, uh, comparing people with, who had like negative encounter, neutral encounter, positive encounter with those people who had no encounter with the police, uh, we found essentially what we expected to find positive uh, uh, effects for those who had positive encounter, negative effect for those who had a negative encounter, and no effect for those who had a neutral encounter. What was surprising for us is that we found the same relationship for both process and outcome satisfaction, not only for process as we originally expected. Uh, yeah, no, neutral neutral encounters um, or encounters that went as people expected, um, but there was no no significant difference um, in comparison with those with no encounter. Thank you, Tiago. Um, now, uh, lots of questions uh, this afternoon. We've got the final question now. Um, it's, 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 it's addressed to Justice, but again, I think it's uh, relevant to the the whole panel so um it's uh, so similar to the seriousness variable you've considered a motivational variable to your research i.e monetary value revenge leniency in respect to crimes committed by the supplier of the information how do you how do such motivations fit with procedural justice oh i think that's an excellent question um these are, I think, interesting uh, potential correlates, um, but they are ones that I, I haven't yet explored in my own work. Uh, what I have done in the past um, has been to compare uh, procedural justice with rational choice related uh, issues. So for example, um, in a study on uh, cooperation with anti-corruption institutions in Ghana, I studied uh, um, university students and I measured both uh, perceptions of procedural justice 
but also the risk of being uh, caught for um, engaging in corruption, um, issues around collective action, and, and so forth. And interestingly, in that study, uh, procedure justice wasn't really important in shaping people's willingness to work with the anti-corruption institutions. It was rather the rational choice related uh, 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 variables that, that mattered. But I think these are the ones that the, the, uh, the questioner has um, identified, reward, monetary rewards, revenge. Uh, no, I haven't explored them, but I, I suspect that there could be um, an interesting relationship between any of these and procedure justice in influencing uh, uh, supply of information to, uh, uh, to the police. So, um, of course, procedure justice has been uh, um, framed as one that, um, as a situation in which people would be willing to cooperate with the police, not so much on the basis of the rewards that they stand to gain, i.e. Uh, the police has a, a reward for supplying information. So that's the motivation for doing that. The city justice suggests that people are norm users. They care much more about um, the normative status of the police, how fairly they treat people. That's what matters to them. So one would expect that um, if anything, uh, the effects of monetary reward or any other incentive would be swamped as it were by concerns about procedure justice. That, that's the way that I would see the, uh, the relationship. Okay, right. I think um, that, that was our last question, so we can bring it to an end there. But can I just uh, uh, thank our speakers? Um, you know, without our speakers, there'd be no seminar series. So we're we're hugely grateful for your for your time and and for your wise words and presentations. So um, th thank you very much for that. And uh, I hope uh, you'll also be able to join us on our our next uh, seminar, which is on no Tuesday, November the 9th, the same time, two to four p.m. And it will be on surveillance. We've uh, confirmed one speaker, Gary Marks, and we have other speakers uh, to be confirmed. Um, so that will be our next seminar. And then we have another one on the 14th of December, which will be on violence. Um, and we're going to confirm our speakers there. So uh, two two more seminars uh, in a series of seven. Um, so I ho hope you join us. We've, we've had close to 100 people attend today and uh, lots of really good questions. So I hope you've in, in enjoyed uh, the event and hope you come to the next one. As always, we will release details via uh, Twitter, LinkedIn and our, our various networks. And we hope to uh, uh, see you at the next event. So thank you, everybody. Okay, guys.